Good evening, everybody. This is Pastor Ryan at First Baptist Church in Hillsville, and we are completing our Bible study in the book of First Peter tonight. Uh, we are going to be in chapter 5, but let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for this short little journey we've been on for the last few weeks of, of diving into the book of First Peter and the words that you've spoken to us uh, through Peter. Father, we're so grateful that your, your truth is so timeless that it speaks to us no matter when and where we are in, in life and in this world. And Father, we're so grateful to have a God that loves us enough to share this truth with us so that we can grab a hold of it, that we can use it to live victoriously in the midst of a hostile world. Father, that we can triumph in the midst of our suffering. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So here we are. We have finally made it to the last chapter, chapter 5 in the book of 1 Peter. We've been talking about living victoriously in the midst of a hostile world. We've been talking about triumphing through suffering and persecution. And now, uh, like any pastor worth his salt, Peter wants to leave us with a note of encouragement, uh, something that we can really kind of grab hold of and uh, feel good about and, and kind of run with here. So he wants to to encourage the people that he's talking to. In verse 5, he says, Therefore, I urge elders among you as your fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and one who is also a fellow partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. So he's just giving them uh, almost motivation through uh, a couple, well, three different things really, um, through identification here. So he says, I urge you, here's the motivation, I urge the elders among you, the, the shepherds, the pastors, the overseers among you, those people who are shepherding the flock. Um, typically back then they would have had multiple people that were kind of in that role, so to speak. But elder, uh, as the title being used, emphasizes really their, their spiritual maturity. So the spiritual, spiritually mature leaders of the church, I want to urge you, and who am I to do that, says Peter, as your fellow elder, so he's motivating them through identifying with them. Um, I'm just one of you. I'm, I'm a spiritually mature leader like you guys are. Um, so that should be motivation for them. And a witness, now he's motivating through authority. He's a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Peter walked with Christ. Peter was with Christ through his suffering. And one who was also a fellow partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. The motivation now is one of anticipation. Hey guys, this is what's to come. The glory that's to be revealed. Christian leaders one day are going to receive from Christ a reward for their service. That, that should motivate them to faithful duty in carrying out that service. Verse 2. Well, hold on. The glory that's to be revealed, we just said Peter walked with, with Christ. Um, I think when he talks, talks about the being a fellow partaker of the glory that's to be revealed, um, I think we can read that in two ways. Number one is all believers, uh, like Peter, are going um, to be fellow partakers in the glory that's to be revealed. Peter is unique, though, in that he has actually experienced some of that glory because he was present during Christ's transfiguration. Um, so he is actually experience the transfiguration of Christ already. So he does kind of have a little bit of a special experience there, uh, but it also just means more that he can express that to people and say, we're going to be fellow partakers in that. You're going to get to experience that too. Verse 2, here's what I want to urge you to do. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, that's what elders do, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not with greed, but with eagerness. So shepherd the flock of God is, is really saying feed them, teach them. That's what feeding them is, is teaching them. Um, th that is why I think 1 Timothy 3.2 and Titus 1.9, uh, which are part of passages that are traditionally used as the qualifications to be an elder, states that one of the qualifications to be an elder of the church is to be a teacher because you've got to be able to feed the sheep. The other part of shepherding is protecting. That means you've got to be sound in your own doctrine to be, able to, uh, to be able to recognize and to teach against false teachers. 
Um, so you've got to be able to feed the sheep. You've got to be able to protect the sheep. Shepherd the flock of God. Whose flock is it? Well, it's not the pastor's flock. It's not the elder's flock. It's God's flock. It's the flock of God. Exercising oversight. Yep, that's what they do. Not under compulsion, but voluntarily. That's really just saying, don't be lazy or indifferent to what you're doing. Don't get complacent that, you know, you're the elder and you can do whatever. No, don't be lazy. Don't be indifferent. Do it according to the will of God and, invol- and voluntarily. Not with greed, but with eagerness. There are several passages, uh, 1 Timothy 5, 7, again, kind of in that same little area. 1 Timothy 5, 7 says to pay good pastors well. Can I get an amen? Amen, amen. Uh, If you're on your, uh, whatever you're watching on right now, if you want to leave a comment, uh, leave an amen, that would be great. Um, It says to pay good pastors well. Um, And I guess that leads to the next question of what makes a good pastor. So maybe, maybe don't leave that comment. Um, never mind. Pay good pastors well. But his point is that pastors should never be motivated by money. That's not why you do what you do. And sadly, we do have uh, pastors that are out there that have learned that they can make a good living. They can earn a good living because they can talk a good game. But there is more to being a shepherd of God's flock than that. Um, and he's going to get to that here uh, in the next verse, actually. So it just says, don't be motivated by money. All right, do it with eagerness. Do it because you're called to it. Do it because you love God. You love serving him. And that's what you're called to do. Verse three, nor yet. So he's saying, don't don't lead this way. Don't shepherd this way. Nor yet as domineering or as lording over those assigned to your care. Don't be a demagogue. All right. Um, It's kind of speaking to leadership by intimidation or manipulation. Don't do that. Well, okay, if, if that's not what you do, nor yet is domineering over those assigned to your care, when, how should you lead? But by pro- proving to be examples. That is true spiritual leadership. Being an example for the flock of what Christian life, Christian leadership, Christian living looks like. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd, everybody knows who that is, that's Jesus, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown or wreath, that's what they use back there, of glory. If you're serving righteously, this says, Christ judges that. Cool. So if you're serving righteously, that's awesome. Christ is going to judge that you're serving righteously. He's going to give you, you're going to receive the unfading crown of glory. Is that an actual crown? I don't think so. The crown of glory is eternal life. You're going to receive eternal life. Um, but in the New Testament world here, the illusion, obviously, um, is, is to the thing that's given for victorious achievement. If you actually shepherd the flock as God would have you to do, then you're going to receive an unfading crown of glory. You're going to receive eternal life. Verse 5, you younger men or younger people, likewise, so I just talked to the elders. I just talked to the spiritually mature leaders of the group. And now at the same time, you younger people, likewise, be subject to your elders. Submit to them is what he's saying. Give honor, deference, respect to spiritual leadership. That's how things are supposed to function. Submission. Be subject to your elders and all of you, whether you're elders or younger people or whatever, clothe yourself with humility. Make it a part of your life. Tie it in to be humble. Uh, We hear that and we're like, yeah, of course, you know, humility, Christian, blah, blah, blah. Humility back in the ancient world was not considered a virtue. Not at all. It was considered weakness. So for Peter to be telling them, hey, you need to put humility on, wrap it around you like a cloak and make it a part of who you are, that flew in the face of what culture teaches And even though we know that as Christians now, we know that teaching as Christians now, I don't know that humility is particularly celebrated any more in our current world than it was back in the ancient world. We tend to still look upon humility as weakness. But Peter tells us, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. What does that mean? Others are first. Others are first. With humility toward one another. Because God 
is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Uh, that's kind of pulling out of the Septuagint again, Proverbs 3.34, Peter reinforcing his point about clothing yourself with humility. Why? Because God's opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I told you if you listen to the first Peter chapter four Bible study that uh, Peter's giving us kind of some very brief lists of things in these last two chapters. Um, one of the things that he's got in here it are the three major temptations for pastors to be aware of. We get out of these verses. Um, here they are. Laziness, we mentioned, that's in verse 2. Dishonest finances or, or monetary motivations, that's in verse 2 as well. And then that demagoguery, uh, setting yourself up as kind of the ruler, so to speak, instead of the leader, uh, governing by intimidation and manipulation rather than as trying to set an example for godly living for the rest of the flock. So laziness, monetary motivation, demagoguery. He's also already starting to touch on another list, and it's the three attitudes necessary for victorious living. Verse 5, he gives us the first one, submission. Okay, Be subject to your elders. If you're going to live victoriously, you've got to learn to submit. That's part of being a Christian. Humility is another one. That's in verses 5 and 6. He even kind of pulls that out twice. Humility is important. And lastly, verse 7, which is going to carry us over um, here, well, 6 and 7, is trust. You've got to trust if you're going to live victoriously. So let's, uh, let's get into verses 6 and 7 here, and that'll take us towards the home stretch here in our Bible study. Verse 6, therefore humble, here it is, second time, humble yourselves, don't fight God's purpose, uh, even when he utilizes testing to bring them about. Remember, that's the context that all this is going on in this persecution, hostile world, all that stuff. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Mighty hand of God is an Old Testament symbol of the power of God working in the experience of people to accomplish his sovereign purpose. Uh, it's the fact that God's power, the mighty hand of God, is able to actually reach in and organize and coordinate and work things and work things for good of those who love him. Um, therefore, we humble ourselves under that, recognizing that power and God's working in our experiences. Why? So that he may exalt, lift you up at the proper time. Having cast, there's your trust, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him, trust him with all of that, Trust God to know what he's doing in your life. And guess what? Know it better than you do. Having cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares about you. He cares about you. He wants what's best in your life. And he knows it. He knows what's best. We think we know what's best in our lives. But we don't. We don't know what's best in our lives. And we don't always seek it. But we can trust him because he cares for us and he does know. So we humble ourselves that he's working in our lives. We trust him to do it. And we trust him to strengthen us through it. Verse 8. And again, I told you in chapter 4, there are so many tie-ins here between this Bible study and our sermon series on spiritual warfare that I really want to encourage you to go listen to that spiritual warfare series but the next two verses are two of the big important verses when it comes to spiritual warfare and understanding what is going on with us living in this hostile world and the battles that we face. Verse 8, be of sober spirit, says Peter. Trust does not equal carelessness. Yes, you trust God for your life and your experience here, but that's not carelessness. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Why? Always be on the alert because your adversary, the devil, the accuser, uh, the, the, the one who accuses men to men and men to God and God to men, who makes all these accusations, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He seeks to take Christians out of fellowship and out of service. How does he do it? Temptation, persecution, 
discouragement, all those kinds of things are how he devours us. Verse 9, what do we do? Resist him. Stand up against him. How do we do that? We recognize it. We cling to the promises of God. We trust in God's strength. We trust in the mighty hand of God to work in our experiences, to fight alongside of us. Resist him, firm in your faith. That really means stand firm in your faith. Know sound doctrine and obey God's truth. Know who you are. Know how God wants you to live. Know what God wants for you and live it out. Seek to be obedient. Stand firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences, take encouragement from this, the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers and sisters who are in the world. All, the, the, the whole Christian community shares this common experience of suffering. They also share God's mighty hand at work within that experience of suffering. And there's brothers and sisters around the world who have already gone through it and who have been strengthened by it, who are going through it and are being strengthened by it. You're sharing in that with them and all of us are sharing in that suffering with Christ. We're partners together and partners with him. Verse 10, after you have suffered for a little while, Christian, live with the understanding that God's purposes in the future require some pain in the present. I know you don't want to hear that. I didn't want to hear that. But that's really what he's getting at. You're going to suffer. Where you need to get to is going to require some pain here and now. It's just the truth. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will do what? He will perfect confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Suffering leads to perfection. The enemy attacks, God strengthens. That's what's going on in the spiritual battle. That's the experience that we're going through. And we don't always feel it. We don't feel like we're being built up. But we get to look back on it and see how God's mighty hand was at work through that experience and be strengthened through it. All of that, after you have suffered for a little while, it leads to perfection, confirmation, strengthening, and establishing you. God is working through that struggle to produce strength of character. He is spiritually maturing you. He is growing you. He is strengthening you through that struggle. Because of that, we offer up the prayers, verse 11, to him be dominion forever and ever. This is the ruler, creator, God of the universe. And what does he do? He takes our struggles and he uses it to make us, make us better. To him be dominion. Thank God he is in control. Thank God he is our God. Verse 12. Now he's just wrapping it up. Um, this last part doesn't have any uh, necessarily any deep spiritual meaning, but it, it's great for our context and tying other things together. Um, so... Through Sylvanus is, is what mine says. Sylvanus, same, same guy as Silas. Uh, we, we know the name Silas. as a guy who often traveled with Paul, um, even though we're talking about Peter here. Uh, he was considered a, a prophet. He was a Roman citizen. Um, and in this case, for Peter, he's acting as an amanuensis, which is a really fancy word that says he was writing down what Peter was telling him to. Um, so he was doing the writing here. So through Silas, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I, Peter, have written to you briefly, exhorting or encouraging and testifying that this is the true grace of God. One of the graces of God is that strengthening that comes through our suffering and his work in it. Stand firm in it, Peter says. Stand firm knowing that that grace is at work in your life. Verse 13, she who is in Babylon, this is a uh, kind of a code way here because this is coming at the beginning of persecution. Remember, that's the context we're in. This is a group of believers who are beginning to face persecution. He's trying to encourage them. So she who is in Babylon is really uh, Peter's way of saying that uh, there's a church in Rome chosen together with you, uh, sends you greetings. The church in Rome sends you greetings. And so does my son, 
Mark. This is John Mark. Um, Peter here is claiming him as a spiritual son of, of his. Um, John Mark, if you remember, is the, the same Mark who once failed Paul and was sent away. They were later reconciled, which is great. And, and Paul actually requested his presence towards the end of his life. Um, it, it's curious that, that Mark here is referred to so warmly, not that he shouldn't be, um, just tying again all things together. You've got this guy, Mark, who once um, failed Paul and was sent away because of it. Um, and he's, he's being welcomed warmly and, and associated with Peter. Peter calls him his own son. Peter himself is a guy who failed Christ three times. You would think, and, and I think is the case, he's got a soft spot for Mark because of that, that shared experience as well. Um, tradition actually holds that it was Peter and Peter's experiences, but, but Peter himself who actually worked with Mark to write the Gospel of Mark, that he was a part of that process as well. That's kind of what tradition holds. And then he's going to wrap it all up um, with kind of a, a traditional ending to a letter. Verse 14, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you all who are in Christ. Peace be to all the brothers and sisters in Christ. Absolutely. So here we go. Um, attitudes. This is our last little list here. Attitudes needed for a believer to grow in Christ to maturity. Here's what he gives us. This is a, a longer list here. We got nine things. Um, the first three we already touched on. Submission, humility, trust. Um, verse five, six, and seven. Then we get into verse eight. Make sure I got that right. Yep. Be of sober spirit. Sober minded sober mindedness Ooh, good thing i don't have to say that three times fast um, be alert be aware know what's going on be alert be aware be sober minded verse eight have a vigilant defense that's verse eight and nine know what satan is trying to do know that spiritual warfare is going on have a vigilant defense stand up resist him stand firm in your faith verse eight and nine have hope that's in verse 10 have hope that God is working in your life through that suffering. Let that lead to worship. That's verse 11. To him be dominion forever and ever. Worship him. Then we have faithfulness in verse 12. Our faithful brother. And finally, have affection. That's verse 13 and 14. Have affection, especially for other brothers and sisters in Christ. Others who are partners with you in this suffering, and all of us who are partners together with Christ through this suffering. So that, through the mighty work of God's mighty hand, we might be perfected, we might be strengthened, we might be brought to spiritual maturity in Christ Jesus through our suffering, that we might triumph through our suffering just as Jesus Christ found his greatest moment of triumph the greatest moment of triumph in the history of earth through his suffering. Guys, I, I hope that this is a word through all of 1 Peter that has really spoken very clearly into your life as a Christian, uh, into knowing that we do live in a hostile world. As Christians, we, we have no reason to expect that the world would treat us well. Um, we follow God. We follow Jesus Christ. We've given our lives to him. We have chosen sides, and the side that we chose is not the side of the world. It is not the side that is Satan's dominion. And so we've placed ourselves in the battle. We've chosen sides on that, uh, and it is a battle. There will be suffering. There will be persecution, and the more the world sees of Christ in your life, the greater that persecution and struggle will be. So expect it, but yet we always have hope because we know that God is working through those things just as he worked through Christ's suffering as well. So I hope that lifts you up, encourages you, upholds you. Um, I do want to encourage you again, go to our website. Uh, you can watch the entirety of this series on, uh, under our resources menu. There is a, an option there for Bible studies, and we have uh, Bible studies listed in there. You can do the same thing under resources. There's one for sermons. You can actually search through our sermons. You can find the series on spiritual warfare uh, and other 
series and sermon topics as well through there and watch those. So I hope you'll do that. Whenever you do, I hope that you'll leave us a, a comment. Let us know that you were there. Uh, share with us how it spoke to you, um, how it encouraged you. Let other people know that as well. Thank you guys for taking part in this. We will move on to Second Peter coming up in our next Bible study. So I hope that you will join us for that. And until then, peace, love, and soul, brothers and sisters.